Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it was a better week this week for the Calgary Flames, and Matt, I think we can both agree the sky is no longer falling as the Flames pick up five of possible eight points this week. I think this is pretty much the bare minimum to get a pass on this week. They they got their, their D or D-plus or whatever the minimal passing grade is? Uh, D-minus. <laughs> they just skated over the line. Well, as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, let's jump right in and take a look at this week. We had four games, two against Toronto, two against Ottawa. And let's start off with the game on Monday against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, the Calgary Flames won this game 3 nothing against the Leafs. Matthews' uh, point streak was ended, and the Flames shut out the Maple Leafs with goals from Sam Bennett, Matthew Kachuk, and Sean Monaghan. 3 nothing looks good on the board. David Riddick and Ned for this one. Um, did you think that the Flames play against the Maple Leafs match what we saw on the scoreboard? Uh, I thought that, uh, frankly, Riddick did a very good job of bailing the team out. Um Like, this should have been a one-goal game, I think, either way. And I think that uh, Toronto definitely had their chances, and the goalie got the two points. And uh, the team in front of them played better than they had the previous week, but not really quite good enough, I think, to match a team like Toronto. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think that David Riddick is the story of this game coming in, as we know. Um, Markstrom not playing at all this week. I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. But Markstrom not playing at all. Riddick coming in and looking like the starting goaltender we know Riddick can be. But the Flames did not, as you said, play the type of game you'd expect to beat the Maple Leafs. They got lucky here and Riddick bailed them out. Yeah, and they did capitalize on their chances and credit to the three goal scorers for chipping in it's just uh, with a team like Toronto who is clearly the best team in the division you need to be able to elevate your game to go stride for stride with them and I thought that the Flames were a step behind pretty much the entire game they were able to cover a lot of positional errors or mistakes but it, you know, they did get very fortunate with the goaltending. And pretty even shots on goal here. Calgary got 33, the Leafs got 34. Interesting stat, though. The Flames ended up beating the Leafs 61-39% to 39% in the faceoff circle. And I think that really, when you look at this game, we did see the Flames, I'd say, controlling the play a lot more than they're used to, and I think that's why. When you win that faceoff, you get the first couple seconds to decide how, you know, how things are going to turn out. Yeah, exactly. And any time you win the faceoffs, you're guaranteeing yourself a few seconds at least, and you aren't having to make the other team work for it. So that's always a good thing. And then the Flames played the Maple Leafs in Toronto again on Wednesday, and not as great a result in this one. Uh, this is a three-point game. Calgary ended up losing two to one against Toronto in overtime. Um, the Calgary Flames in this one had Riddick in again, and the goal scorer uh, was Andrew Mongepani for the Flames, and Nylander got both for Toronto. What do you think about the Flames in this one, Matt? Uh, this was a game that Riddick nearly stole again, and it, frankly, he deserved a shutout with how he performed in this game. The team in front of him, none of the skaters showed up, frankly. It was so weird because, I mean, that Monday game I didn't think was great, but it was better than the games we talked about last week. And then we get to this Wednesday game, and it's almost as though Monday didn't happen. It's almost like we came fresh out of last week. Like, it's Jekyll and Hyde, two very different Flames teams two days apart. Yeah, like, this was all of, like, what we saw last week, where it was a, a turkey shoot, frankly, for Toronto. Like, they were just running laps right around the Flames, and as if they were standing st- still. And, you know, it, it was remarkable that it was tied with three minutes remaining when Andrew Mangiapane scored the go-ahead goal, and then even then they couldn't find a way to hold the zone for three minutes. Yeah, this is one of those games where you're almost surprised your team comes away with one point. You know, like the Flames deserve to lose this one. And I think that, like you said, Riddick kept them in it and got them the one. 
Yeah, and frankly, I think that uh, all three of the first three games this week, that the Flames really did deserve zero points, but did manage to walk away with three of them. So it's well, that's why I like the barely skating by passing grade. Because, yeah, you got five points, but like how you did it was, uh, y- yeah, not <laughs> really. Points. You should have got two. <laughs> Points are points. Should we talk about the one where they got none out of those first three? True. This and is this is the one that pains me, Matt. Yeah, well. Thursday yeah. night, the Calgary Flames went to the nation's capital to take on the last place Ottawa Senators and ended up getting their butts handed to them 6-1 to one by the Senators. Matt Murray made 29 saves. Um, and the Flames, I would say in this one, really got embarrassed. Yeah, this was a game where, you know, the difference between the best and the worst team is not that huge, like, compared to, like, the 80s and 90s, and even early 2000s, where, like, there were some really deadbeat teams. Like, the, the, now, like, Ottawa can beat you if you don't respect them, and they, you could see, were skating and trying and were willing to lay the body when needed, and were engaged. They don't have any talent compared to the other teams in the league, but the effort's there. And then you see the Flames, who gave zero effort, and 6-1 to happen. And we should mention in this one, uh, Artem Zagadulin made his NHL debut. Zags, as they call him, number 50. In relief, he played 28-13 as a goaltender here because David Riddick uphold. And Matt, I mean, for me, I just... Riddick, I find, is a guy who's pretty consistent. He's either good all night or bad all night. And after the uh, Batherson goal and then the good Branson goal, you could just tell that he'd ha- he, he was done. Like, you could just tell that Riddick's head wasn't in it. Yeah, well... It's one of those things, when the team in front of you is playing as bad as they are and, like, literally giving the puck to the Senators in prime areas to score goals, you know, it, it's one of those, like, you are you can only do so much. And, like, if you're getting zero help and, frankly, your teammates are setting up the other team with beautiful setups in the slot, it's like, you know... So, like, when that the fourth goal happened, it was deflected. Like, I can't blame Riddick on that one, it, even though it was from center ice because it was deflected, and you're not expecting the defenseman to try and knock it down like that. And, you know, like, there, there's only so much you can do. And, and for a guy like, who's only played, what, five games before this, asking him also to play on the back-to-back, I think he was probably out of gas. Yeah, and like him getting frustrated and slamming his head on the door on the way out. You know, like I can understand that. Like when you have 18 skaters in front of you and not one of them's giving an effort in earnest. You know, it's like what 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 am I even doing here? At the you know, same like, time, I was worried we might lose two goalies, and I'm not very confident with uh, Deming and Zagadulin. Deming and Zagadulin is our pair. Well. It, rem- it would remind me of the Young Guns era. You know, they brought back the uh, Horsehead jersey, so, you know, bring back the, the seven goalies or whatever we well, used that one year. I was going to say, in that case, where's Freddie Brathwaite? What's he up to yeah. these days? Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was... And, and I understand it, and Dave's a passionate goalie. And, he, I mean, that was the passion of just, you know, he was getting frustrated with, I think, the team and with himself. And there's reason to be frustrated. I mean, 6-1 loss to any team is embarrassing especially the senators losing to the senators period is kind of embarrassing just because anytime you're losing to the literally the worst team in the league that's not ideal but then on top of it to get blown out in the way that you did where it wasn't the goaltender's fault on any of it and except for the fifth goal that was kind of weak but you know, by then, like, who cares? Well, the fifth goal also came with Zega Doolin and Nat, a guy who's new to the NHL, and I think there's only so much you can, you know, criticize a, a goaltender coming in relief playing his first game. True. So, you know, like... Again, yeah, it wasn't like, just him. I mean, there's a lot of blown coverage on the fifth goal. Yeah. Like, it, it, everything just kind of... 
did not go optimally for the Flames. I got a couple people on Twitter ask, why is Zegadula not Louis Domingue? Louis Domingue actually had to go to a funeral, so he had to leave the team. Therefore, he's back in quarantine before he can rejoin us. That's why uh, Artem, Artem Zegadula was uh, the Flames' backup this week. So I believe... Which, you know... Um Honestly, I prefer having Zagadulin get the opportunity just because of the fact that with him being a European free agent, he got his cup of coffee in the NHL at least. So, you know, it's enticing to any potential free agents that, hey, you know, if you're signing with us, you will play. If you're, you know, and so get, getting him that opportunity helps from a like overall franchise marketing standpoint. I don't disagree, but I think if we're going to be carrying a guy to back up Riddick, I would rather be carrying Deming, a guy who's had some agile success. True. But, you know, it worked out all right. Like, there's positives for both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, like I think it, it's, I it's, think it's good like Zag's gonna... got the... I think it's good Zag's got the start, but I think as soon as Deming is out of quarantine, you put Deming back on the taxi squad. Yeah. Because I, I think that, you know, Domingue has nothing left to gain from either sitting on the tax squad or going to the AHL, but I think Zagadulin still has some growth in the AHL. Yeah. And with a back-to-back coming up this weekend, maybe we'll see either uh, Zagadulin or Domingue back in net. We'll, we'll see what happens. Well, hopefully but, Mark swims back in by then, but let's hope we'll so. We'll see. So the, the Flames in the end of that last game, and I guess the only thing people were talking about was that uh, the third period, Jeff Ward decided to change things up, and we saw this change move through to the next game. The Calgary Flames reverted to their lineups from last year, their forward lines that we saw from last year, and moved this into the next game of the week as well, the the uh, Saturday 11, was it 11 a.m. game, when the Calgary Flames ended up winning 6-3 to three against the Senators. Uh, of note in this one, Yusuf Alamaki got his first goal of the season. And I thought the Flames played a much better overall game with a very different look to the lineups. Just to read through it for fans that didn't see it. Uh, the top nine reverted to what we saw most time last year. So we had Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monahan, and Elias Lindholm on the right of that line. Then we had Matthew Kachuk, Michael Backlund, and Andrew Mangiapane as, as line two. And then the third line, we went back to Milan Lucic, Sam Bennett at center, and Dylan Dubé on the right. And the fourth line was whoever else was dressed, which happened to be Nordstrom, Godden, and Levo. And saw some great success here. And I don't think, Matt, we can just say, well, they changed the lines, now we'll be successful. But I think it was definitely probably that idea of familiarity, right? And guys were more familiar and maybe feeling more confident playing with guys they knew. Well, the thing is, is that uh, with uh, the uh, trying out the lines that they have thus far this season, like it was a good idea because of the fact that it f- made some alterations to try and increase scoring depth and like a few other and plug you know, some holes positive in the right. goal- Yeah, like positive goals. None of it worked, and like this team has been frankly embarrassingly bad for where they should be and so reverting to things that did work last year while not ideal um like the center depth takes a hit with uh instead of Lindholm Monahan it goes Monahan Backlund that it, you know that's fine it's just not as gr- good of a group up the middle but you know, it hopefully rekindles some of the scoring ability from the three lines, and if they can get those guys running in the same direction at least, then that would be a lot better. After, what, four periods of these lines, I don't want to say this is the savior, this is what the Flames have to do to, you know, save their season, but it's definitely looking promising right now, and if I were Jeff Ward, I would continue to run these lines for the foreseeable future, just because you did see some great success against them. Or, or against the Senators with these lines, I should say. And you have the Senators again uh, twice more. So I'd at least, or three times more, I would at least run these lines um, a- until the end of the Senators series and then reevaluate. Yeah, and let's see. You know, it's just like with uh, them putting Sam Bennett with Gaudreau and Monaghan for a few games, it seemed to improve Bennett's play for the, that duration. And. It, you know, it's 
if they, they they can roll these lines for a bit. Like, you look at the overall team thus far this season, right? And basically the goaltending has been the the rock for this team. And most of the defense core has played above where they were last season. And, like, you look... The only guy who stepped back a bit was Mark Giordano. Uh, and even now, like, he's getting back to it. So the bulk of the Flames' issues has been their forward lines and their forward scoring to date. And if they can start getting those guys going in a positive manner, then I think a lot of the Flames' problems will solve themselves just due to the quality of the defense and goaltending. I agree. I don't think this game was perfect. I think there's still some things that when I watched this game, I wasn't too happy with in terms of the way the Flames played, but I think it was definitely a a more complete game for this team than we saw all week. And, and I think it's, you know, you could just tell that they were more confident in playing the game and feeling better about themselves. And Suns, that's where you got to start when you're on a slump. Yeah, well, like if you go all the way back to the first two Toronto games, like the, the, I think this is the best that they played since then. I'd and, agree. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where this team just needs to... Like, okay, the lo- the first two months happened, as they are, and, okay, reset button, we have two and a bit months left to go, let's go. And, you know, it, it, it happened as it did, big deal, you're basically in a playoff spot right now, or close to it, and, you know, like, you look at our, the benefit of being in the Canadian division, there's only seven teams. You have two teams that are functionally out of it between Ottawa and Vancouver. So, of the five teams, four are going to make it. You have to beat one team. So, like, you know, despite all of the struggles and all of everything screwing up to date, you're right in the hunt. You're, I think, tied with Montreal right now, and a couple points behind Winnipeg. It It's easily fixable. It's just you have to start getting into those good habits. And, you know, like, the expectations are that this team should be second or first in this division, but, you know, the first two months happened. So, you know, it, it's doable that they could get back to second, but, you know, they have to start getting that consistency, and hopefully this was the first in a series of games where they're starting to build on that. Well, you mentioned they were tied with Montreal. Let's take a look at where we stand in the Scotia North Division. As of today, uh, the 28th of February, the Calgary Flames have played 22 games, and they're fifth with 22 points. They're 10-10-2, and two, um, playing 500 hockey right now. Montreal's one point above us at 23 points. Winnipeg is uh, 27, Edmonton 28, and Toronto 34. Below us is Vancouver at 18 points and Ottawa at 15. So you're right. I think Vancouver and Ottawa are definitely out of this. Montreal is obviously slumping because you don't fire your coach just for something to do on a, a Thursday night. Um, you know, so I think Montreal, I think we're going to see a bit of a downswing there. So I think that, you know, Calgary can't take it for granted. But if Calgary can keep putting together, you know, five points out of every eight, no matter how you get them, you're going to make the playoffs. The question is, what can you do in the playoffs? And if they keep playing like this, they're not going to go very far. So you've got to get the points, but you've also got to start putting your game together at some point. Well, like, if you look at the standings as well, like, for the goals against, functionally the Flames are right in the middle of where everybody is. Like, Toronto has uh, 55 goals surrendered, uh, Winnipeg 53, uh, Montreal 60, us 65, and Edmonton 69. So we're right in the middle of that. And, like, we also have played more, so ours is slightly up from a couple of the teams. But So we um, should point that out. Toronto and us have played 22 games, Edmonton 23, Winnipeg 20, Montreal 20, and both Vancouver, uh, Vancouver's a 24, Ottawa's a 23. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, and but you look at the goals scored, like, Toronto scored 78 goals, Edmonton 79, uh, Winnipeg and Montreal both have, like, 69-65. I always like to look it's at the a, differential. And you look at that, and then Calgary's got 58. 
which is the worst of the entire division. So we're minus seven differential, where Montreal team above us is plus five. Uh, Vancouver's minus seven, and Ottawa's minus thirty. So yeah, we don't have as many goals for, but we're we're not doing as bad at that differential between the two. Yeah. So basically, like the point I'm trying to get at is that on the defensive side of things, with everything that's gone wrong with this team thus far. We're basically right in there with everybody. And, yep. and, you know, like, there's not really anything that's hard to differentiate between us and the best And teams. I don't even know if I'd say that's the defensive side or if that's our uh, masked men stealing games for us. Yeah. And to me, then, the defense needs some work. True. But then you look at the, like, how inept the forward group has been. Like, that puts a lot more pressure on the defense. And... You know, because you're not having the puck as much, and you're running around your own zone, and, you know, like, it creates a whole host of problems for the goaltenders and the defensive group. So, like, if the Flames can start getting the forwards sorted out, where they are getting that chemistry... They can straighten this thing out. Yeah, because then you're taking a lot of pressure off of the defense. You're taking a lot more pressure off the goaltender. So even with the elevated goals against, which is still right in the middle of that group, that will come down a bit, and the goals for should go up. So if they can right the ship with the forward group, then you you should start to see Calgary's goal differential becoming slightly more towards the Toronto-Winnipeg end than where we are now. I think that's a good observation. Yeah, I agree with you, Matt. There, we've had our struggles, and I think that you know we're fortunate to have the goalies that we do. And if we had, you know, any other goalies, I think we could be in a lot worse shape. Oh, if we're we're running Talbot and Riddick out there, uh, you know, as much as Riddick played well this week, like uh, both he and Talbot were very up and down last year, and like I, I think that you would see Calgary be more towards the. Ottawa, Vancouver area than where they are now. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, Jacob Markstrom has not played all week. He, um, David Riddick played instead. Markstrom apparently has an upper body injury. Um, as of Sunday, it's reported that he and Derek Ryan are both back on the ice. But you know that the Flames are not going to rush this. I mean, they're paying this guy a lot of money and they want to be the goalie of the future. They're going to give him the time he needs. I don't see any way he plays Monday. I think Riddick plays Monday. You got two days off before you come home. I think the earliest that we see Talbot play is Thursday. And even if he's even if he's feeling well, I would even say, um, you know, maybe don't play him until Saturday against the Oilers. That's one of those where you have to kind of let the goalie dictate like how he's feeling because he's not gonna put himself in a position where like if he's not ready like i think that he realizes that you know riddick is a good enough player where um you don't need to worry about him being in that if i don't think he's on the road trip so he's not gonna play monday yeah um and and i think riddick really I, i really think the thursday game depends on how riddick plays i mean riddick looked Overall, I'd say Riddick looked really good this week. And if he looks good again Monday, I think you've got to keep Riddick going and, and, you know, keep the hot goalie in net. Yeah, it depends. But uh, it, I think that you'll see um, Markstrom in as soon as he's ready. But, you know, I, I think that pretty much by the uh, Thursday game uh, against Ottawa, I think that would be his first game back. I, I don't think you're going to want Riddick to... Especially because Riddick's going to start to get tired if he's playing all these games in a row. So, it's one of those where... Well, yeah, and you the, got, kind and of then have you've, to, got a, you've got a back-to-back. So you're thinking you play Riddick like Thursday, Saturday... Or, sorry, play Markstrom Thursday, Saturday, and Riddick again Sunday? Yeah. I think that would be the best way of going about it. Or enter Louis Domingue? Yeah. If, if Riddick's uh, I, well, I think Riddick, will, if need be, will start all four. But I think Markstrom should be back for the Thursday game and the Saturday game. So that would be my guess. But, you know, injuries, they heal when they do. Riddick has we'll looked see. 
better to me than I expected this year for the guy who's now the bona fide backup. But I think, you know, if David Riddick can keep playing like starter David Riddick, which is what we've seen, I really think that, you know, we've got a really strong tandem this year. And I think the question is just, will Riddick be ready when we call on him? Well, especially in the postseason, sometimes you run into a goalie who struggles uh, for a game or so. And having a viable guy that you can throw in there and spell the starter if need be, like, that's awesome. And so, like, if Riddick, you know, and Riddick's also trying to play for his job next season. And, you know, like, I do not expect him to be back with the Flames after this season, but you know he wants a job somewhere yeah and if you're gonna want an nhl career and like you're gonna see teams that don't necessarily have a starting goaltender like back when edmonton first acquired cam talbot uh, you're going to see some iteration of that where oh we're a youngish and up-and-coming team and we'd like to have you come and try to be our starting goaltender and see how it goes and i think that you know, Riddick is going to try his best to be his best throughout the season. Well, another thing to remember about next year is there's two new goalie jobs coming available that, you know, we're not uh, we're not here this year. And I think, you know, when you, when you think of it that way, that, you know, Seattle needs at least two goalies, there will be enough, there will be enough jobs out there that Riddick will find a home. Mm-hmm. You know, it, there somebody's going to lose a goalie, somebody's going to lose their 1B, or Seattle's going to need a guy. Like, with two more jobs out there, he's probably good enough to be in the league now. And if you add two more jobs, he's definitely good enough to be in the league. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think I, I agree with your assessment, and I think we've talked about that before. I don't think he'll be a Calgary Flame next year, but I think he'll be in the NHL next year. I agree wholeheartedly. So, Matt, looking at these lines that we saw from the Calgary Flames against Ottawa, um, Goudreau, Monahan, Lindholm, Kachuk, Backlund, Mangiapane, Lucic, Bennett, Dubé. I mean, on paper, the lineup, as you were mentioning, especially down the middle, becomes weaker. But at the same time, if you can get one or two really strong lines, you can make up for it. The Calgary Flames came into this one talking about wanting Lindholm at center, and they moved him back to right. Here's a crazy idea for you. If you think Lindholm is the better center than Monaghan, what would you think about moving Sean Monaghan to the right side? He has a big frame. He has a propensity to pass instead of skate. And I think that would make him better along the boards uh, than it would down the middle of the ice. Um, I think that Lindholm is better at checking along the boards. Uh, like He has that intensity to his game where Monaghan plays a bit more passive and I think that just for winning puck battles in the corner I think Lindholm is better at it ideally the Flames would have a a right winger for that line and not insert you know fourth liner that you're trying to shoehorn in here but you know it it is what it is uh, unfortunately like the Flames do need another top nine forward and they don't have it so that that's fine it's just that it creates a unideal situation i think that this version of lineup as much as you might think that lindholm and monahan as your one two centers is the better setup i think this fills the holes the best like when you look on that right wing none of the guys we brought in levo simon um anybody has really stepped up to do anything i think they expected levo to be a top nine guy and he's not even played on the you know every game on the bottom line but i think when i look at this lineup with lindholm on the first line right and mangiapenny second line right you know maybe it's not the quote-unquote best utilization of assets on paper but i think it fills our holes the best yeah, and like frankly, with the level of which all of the signings have played, uh, like honestly, if you threw Ruzitska and Phillips alongside Godin on the fourth line, I think you'd get about the exact same out of that group versus any of the wa- uh, signing guys that they did, and that's just a testament to how poorly those guys have played. That I think they that Treliving was expecting NHL caliber players and thus far they've been kind of like the Alan Quine level 
were adequate to fill in, but not you know somebody that you'd actually want to play on a regular basis. But as we've even said, a lot of our top forwards haven't even looked like top forwards, right? The True. Players are having some issues there now. True. So I think it's that- one of those. Yeah, it's one of those that, like, hopefully if they can get on a roll that some of this kind of stuff will sort itself out, but early and, returns haven't been too good. And, I mean, I understand what the Flames are trying to do line-wise by moving some of these guys around, but I really, I mean, that third line in the playoffs, Dubé, Lucic, Bennett, was a fantastic group, and if we can get them back to where they were in the playing around in the summer, I think we've got a fantastic third line there. And I don't think Michael Backlund was adapting well to the third line. I think putting him back at the second line is where he probably feels the most comfortable. And if you want to get him going, I think that's where he needs to be. I don't really have a problem with this. I mean, I don't think this is your solve or the lines you need for the rest of the season. But I think you keep guys here until you get them going. And then you look at making some changes. Well, the thing is, is that, like, uh, frankly, like the Flames are in this no-man's land where they can't really make any changes and external to the team because of COVID. And they... So, like, all of the potential solutions for this season are in the room. And in order to try and make the best of it, you're, you're gonna have to do things like this to try and get them to work and you know like it it, in the off season yeah you can shuffle the deck chairs a bit to try and get better fits like finding that right winger for the top six and yada 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 but that's one of those things that unfortunately due to circumstance we just simply can't right now and so with them hoping to that like reusing the lines from last year will have a positive impact hopefully that does actually have not a positive impact and they can start getting on a roll instead of what has been yeah and i mean i can see once they get on a roll moving a few guys around here i think the big question in these lineups is i think manjapani's looked better than dube this year and that's why i think he's back on the second line but i think if you can get one of those two guys going, it gives you a little more flexibility at center with uh, Monaghan, Lindholm, and Backlund. But I think it's just all a matter of like getting them going and filling the hole. And to me, I've heard a lot of flack, but like I said, when I look at this lineup, it's the most complete lineup we've got. Yeah, as is with that Ottawa game. Yeah, you know, you might like, want to try Dubé and Mondrapani in the top two right wings, but they're just that's not who they are. They're not both top six guys yet. No, and like you can experiment further down the road with you know, you know young kids like Peltier and uh, Pedersen and all that, but that's not a this year thing that you can do. And so, with what you've got, this is the best I think for now, and see how they respond. And if they respond positively, and if not, then you have to make more changes and try to tweak what's not working and all that kind of stuff. I mean, knock on wood, there's going to be injuries this year. We're fortunate, I think, that we've really only had Markstrom and Ryan so far. But, you know, maybe you got to shuffle these around on injuries or even special teams. Maybe you start, you know, moving guys around again on some of our power play penalty kill units. But, um, yeah, I just – when I look at the guys, like you said, the Flames can't go out and do anything. There's no trades to be made right now that are going to help you on the right side without giving up a top asset. And if you don't want to give up assets and you don't want to trade within – um, within you know Canada, you really got to wait till the off season. And there's some promising right wingers coming up in the off season, but you know as of now, I think you know looking at the pieces we have, not what they should be on paper. Like I think Lebo should be higher and that sort of thing. But based on what we've actually got on the ice, I think this is the most ideal lineup we're going to get. Yeah, and like you've even seen with the trades that have happened it's been either like fourth line grinder for fourth line grinder like uh the Richie and Heinen's trade uh yesterday from Anaheim to Boston but um or you know star player struggling for star player struggling like Dubois and Line and where you know those guys were being a detriment to their lineup so it didn't really impact their team that 
uh, they're gone all of a sudden for a week or two. Um, because they weren't really getting much utilization out of those players when they were in their lineup. So, you know, like if Calgary is going to make a trade, it'll probably be something along the lines of getting a fourth line right winger or center or whatever. And, you know, like... Well, we see, gonna... we see Tree do that every year at the deadline, right? I mean, we see Tree go out and bring in random depth guys been defensemen the last couple of years but just random depth guys and I think really if they're going to do it they need to bring in defensemen over forwards we have enough forward bodies you know if I look on D like I, I agree with you they could go out and get a, a you know a centerman or whatnot but Godden's looking good enough I think if we need bodies we need defensive bodies yeah and you have guys like Ruzitska who could fill in in a pinch in addition to like the whole litany of guys like Richie. but if you're but if you're looking for some NHL bodies yeah but like on the the defense side, you only have like Yellison has a few games yeah. of NHL experience and Shillington and Stone, I guess. Well, I can see them go out and get the quote unquote four board type guy again. You know, the yeah. the guy with some NHL experience. But yeah, I mean, I think with this and as much as we want Lindholm to be a center, you've got to play guys who are the most valuable to you. And right now, I think like you said, there's more value with Lindholm on the wing. Because he can grind it out, and he can when he needs to, and he can, you know, he's a better checker, and I think that he he just does, he plays the right wing better. I know he's probably more comfortable with the center ice position, but, I mean, he's been our best forward probably this year again, but I just think yeah. he, he looks better at the wing. Yeah, and it's the whole money ball type thing uh, from baseball, where... Like, oh, you're a catcher, but you slot better as a first baseman? Well, get your first baseman's glove. Let's go. And, you know, like, it, I think that, you know, if in a bubble you're looking at Lindholm, yeah, he's better as a center. But for what this roster needs, eh, we got Sam Bennett, who's doing good as a third-line center. You have Michael Backlund, who's a good second-line center. You have Sean Monahan, who can be a first-line center. If you didn't have all three of those guys, then I think you'd still keep Lindholm as a center. But you have three that are very passable at the slots that they're in, so, you know, why not where take Lindholm and put him where you're weakest, where you have Andrew Mangiapane, exactly. and then basically the third liners. Like, D Dubé has played well, but he's a third liner, and... Like, they don't have a second line or a first line right winger. And What's it? He's Lindholm more valuable to us right now, fill in a hole. Yeah. And that's all it is. And you know what? I mean, there's there's a lot of guys that have been very successful in the wing. It's not like moving them there is going to hamper his career or anything. I think he can do – I think he could be a right winger for the majority of his career and be that guy that can be your fill-in center. But I think that until we bring in another right winger – um, that's where he's going to have to stay for this team. Or somebody else like Dylan Dubé or, you know, Mangiapane really explodes. I, I don't think you've got any other option. Yeah, and I think that just having that flexibility is a very good practical thing. Just like how they were able to slot Sam Bennett as a right winger. You know, it's just that for the level of his play, he's better as the third line right winger than the first or second line, or for third line center versus the first or second line right winger. You know, sometimes I think that you've got to look at the sum of the parts more than where the parts are. And these lineups, you know, I mean, we saw that Kachuk line look great last year. Um, you know, the Goudreau line, if Goudreau's looking a lot better this year, so if he can continue that with this line, I think we're going to get a better result. Even though the parts not being the might not be where we think they should be, we're going to see the sum of the parts get the Flames what they need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking about that right wing position, I mean, you and I were saying they need to fill it in the offseason. There's not a ton of right wingers available that are really good. There's a couple high-end ones like Brandon Saad, who I think is going to make – um, a killing, and we won't be able to go after. I think Reinhardt might uh, get paid more than he should, but I mean, when you look down the list, and um, you know, of kind of the top guys right now, as much as he's older, I think Mike Hoffman might be the guy to go after. Yeah, if he doesn't or or like a Joel Armia. Like it, it's one of those like they're all of the options kind of are just mediocre. Like Kyle Palmieri is okay. Well. It, 
Kyle Palmieri, you bring in if you need a third line guy, but he's no better than Dubé. Like if you're gonna, if Palmieri's not your top six, so I think you've got Armia or Armia Hoffman. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Sutter. I don't think he's the no, guy you bring in. He's a third line guy, yeah. Um, I mean, if you can get Sod or Reinhardt, you do that, but I don't think they're going to fall within the Flames' budget. So I think, you know, Hoffman, um, Armia, maybe Case, who could break out, but I haven't seen... I mean, he's barely played this year. But yeah, like, it, there's, it's there's really no, hard. There's no first-line right-winger even in, in, our, in UFA. So if you want that guy who's an established you know, right winger, you're going to have to go out and trade for them. Yeah. Um, and even if we don't look at right wingers, I mean, even if we just look at, um, let's say right-handed, because some of these guys are, um, so, some of these guys are left shots. Let's just look at right shot forwards. You know, you might open up a few more spots, but I mean, you know, you're not bringing in Ovechkin if he's a free agent. Uh, you don't want an aging Getzlaff. I don't think you don't want an aging Krejci. Line A is out of your budget. Like, you, you really don't – there's not – the the top guys in this list are all 35-plus. Yeah. Well, like, even if um, you look at, like, um, Getzlaff, like, if you could bring him in on a cheap deal, like, three or four million, then that's doable. But, again, like, all that kind of stuff, it just uh, – like everything depends on the situation. I don't think I you don't bring think... Getzlaff in though, unless um, unless twenty nine Dubé makes some progress. Because I think Getzlaff would be great on a line with Lucic and Bennett. But then what do you do with Dubé? Mm-hmm. Right. Like I think Getzlaff I you bring in if Dubé and Manjapani make uh, headway. Otherwise, I mean, you know, your bet your next best option is almost Nick Bjerkstad out of New- out of Minnesota. Yeah, and like there's a lot of. Yeah, it, it's going to be somewhat tough because there just are not a large amount of good right wingers available. Or period. even right shot, you know, right shot forwards. You know, like a Ryan Getzlav is listed as center, but he's a right shot guy. David Krejci lists as center, right shot guy. So, you know, all I, I bring this up just to say, Matt, that if we're going to solve this problem in the offseason, it's likely going to have to be through trade. Yeah. For sure. Right, and, and I think what that tells us, and we don't know who. I mean, we've talked about 13. Uh, we've talked to you and I about 11 in the past. Somebody's going to have to go to get what we need, and I think that you're going to see at least one core forward moved out at the end of the year. Yeah, and it, I think that like with how this season to date has happened, I think that a lot from like now till the end of the season will dictate the extent and level of the moves that you're making like mm-hmm. are you going to just tweak a little bit or is it going to be a more of a foundational shake and we'll see like it, well I, I think it's also philosophical of if you're saying we don't think that Lindholm is a right winger and we want him to play center then you need to go out and get a top 6 right winger but if you say you know what maybe Lindholm is a right winger now you got to go out and get a 2 or 3 right winger which is a much more affordable cost and therefore, a lesser asset going out. Exactly. And it just, again, depends on, like, a whole litany of information that we don't have yet. <laughs> yeah. And, so. and I mean, is Jeff Ward here next year? Or is somebody else going to come in and want to try somebody else there? Like, you know, this is another piece of information. So, yeah, it's we don't know yet who's going where. But I think the big question that has to be asked for all this to fall into place is... Do you want Lindholm center or right? And I think that changes the acquisition you need quite a bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, and and right now I think he's right. Yeah, and for right now, I think that's all you can do and just see how things shake out over the next few weeks. I agree. Um, you and I chatted about the captain last week, and he wasn't looking great. And I don't know about you, but I think Giordano really came around this week, and we're seeing we saw a much better week for the captain overall this past week. Yeah, and I think he just needs to keep. When Giordano was playing with an edge to him, and he was very much so this week, he that's like the best that you're getting out of him. It's when he kind of gets a little at times complacent not in terms of like 
doing all of the right things. Like, he, that is continuous, but, like, just the intensity level tends to flatten out sometimes. And that's when things are a little less good. So him being passionate the last game, the last couple games, I think is a good start, and hopefully... And we had the discussion about, is he the right guy to wear the C for the Flames? Well, now, I guess they all wear a C, but the captain C uh, for the Flames. And some comments came out from players this week about what a good leader he was and how you know they were really following his lead. So I think that while we might not see it on the outside, I think he probably still is the right guy for right now to wear that C. And it sounds like he's been the rock through some of the hard times here. Yeah, and... It's one of those things that when the team is basically having foundational issues uh, through the entirety of the team, frankly, like the the up until this past game, like the whole organization looked like they didn't know how to find their own rear end with both hands in the search team. So you know, like when you're having like that level of problems where like even the national media is going uh guys what's going on in calgary like you're you know like it's proceeded to a point where okay now you have to ask questions about all of the things because something's wrong let's check it out and you know giordano might not be the problem turn over all the stones yeah, but you have to, in order to fix and figure out the problem, you have to identify it first and then carry on. And, you know, with the whole team not being on the same page, it's a problem. And so now it's figuring out what is the problem, and then, yeah. Yeah, you never ask those questions if your team is doing well. But when the team's not doing well, like you said, you have to really look at everything and say, you know, what might be the issue here? What might be the, you know, the problem? And, or what just might need to change? And I think that's why we were all kind of feeling like maybe that change needed to be made. But hearing the players say this is the right guy, I mean, really, the captain's not for us. The captain's for the players, right? So the fact that the players yeah. are standing behind him, I think, shows he probably is the right guy, even if he's not the one that we all see as the face of this team. Sometimes you do need that silent, you know, as, as Batman says, the silent guardian. But I really think that, um, I, I think he probably is more of the silent type, but he, you know, they all look up to him and that's what you need. Yeah. So if, if, you know, if the players think he's the right leader, who are we to tell them otherwise? Yeah. Well, Matt, I don't think there's anything else to really talk about with the team this past week. Anything that you specifically want to chat about? Yeah. Uh, not really. Uh, it It's really just going to be interesting to see how the next week or two of games break down. And, like, if the team can figure out all of the issues that they've been having or if it's going to be the same kind of thing it just depends and we have to just wait and see and it you know at least the last game was something optimistic to look at we'll see i feel much better going into march than i did going into last week of february true based on what we've seen like you said there's a lot to build on but i feel much better this week than I did last week after, you know, after a terrible week, the one before. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, frankly, with this team, just going to have to take it week by week. And, you know, each week will give us more of a picture of, like, are they past what was ailing them? Are they not? If so, then what? And, you know, like all the permutations and all that kind of fun stuff. So we'll have a lot of interesting shows still. And I think we have to remember, too, that even with the team winning, there's still a lot going on that isn't right for this team. And there's a difference between winning and sort of winning properly. You're being ready for the playoffs. And I think, for me, they're winning, and that's great. But even a couple years ago when they were the top of the West – 
they really weren't doing it correctly and they weren't winning, you know, games the way they needed to. And I think for me right now, I would rather see good structured hockey than a bunch of W's. Yeah, and like a consistent effort, like where you're not starting the first period and then, oh, it's 2 nothing for the opposition and now we have to actually try to get those back and yeah you know, like all just all the dumb stuff that we've seen frankly yeah and and i mean you obviously need the wins don't get me wrong right i mean wins are wins yeah. are what's gonna get us the playoffs but i would rather that they take a couple losses if they have to or kate take a couple ones if they have to instead of two points and build on the game because so often we're seeing them play a good game and get a win and then they're just falling apart the next night. So I'd rather spend some time getting this team in sync, even if it means giving up some points right now. Yeah. Uh, well, like, you look at, like, even last season um, and before, like, it, them not being able to play 60 minutes, and, like, especially, like, the game four, I think, against Dallas, where they were up in the last 10 seconds... You know, just, like, being consistent, or, like, the game against Toronto, where they had it, and they lost it, because they couldn't just play three minutes of hockey. And, like, if they can sort out these details and start to figure out how to give reliably consistent efforts in those high-pressure situations, then things will start to come around it's just that it you know like it, frankly the flames thus far this season have been too easy to beat it's a good way to look at it it's a good way to look at it for sure and and i think that, that that's the thing that they need to change is not being easy to beat and and even if you know it causes some some losses you just got to play harder you got to go out there and be hard to beat like you said yeah, well, like, you look at, like, back when Chicago was first starting to be the, like, potential dynasty that they were, like, they didn't, it almost was like they didn't really care if you actually beat them, but they made you earn it, and, like, were like, yay, good for you, you actually beat us, because you earned it, whereas Calgary, with how they're playing lately, it's like, oh, you know, like, you're kind of surprised if the Flames win the game more so than, you know, because, like, the opposition just runs over the team. Like, the, at every stage of things, like, especially as it gets towards the end of the game, like, the Flames aren't forcing the issue continually and making the, the opposition beat them on each of the plays. And I think that you know, if they can figure out how to just engage the other team more and pressure them more, then, you know, make them earn it. Like, if you lose a game, like, it's not the end of the world. But make them actually, you know, pay the full dollar to <laughs> beat you. And I, well, and, and just, you and I talked about it last week as well. Of I, you know, who are we? And I think part of what you're done was just establishing our identity. Yeah, and it, it doesn't like you don't even. How, how would you say it? like you don't even really need an identity to put the effort in? Like you saw Ottawa in the first game against them this week. Ottawa's a bad team, and like they're just a mishmash of miscellaneous pieces. But the effort was there. And they forced the issue and made the most of their opportunities. And like Calgary, you're just not seeing any of the effort at all at any stage of the game. And it's like when the Flames get down, then you see them actually try to get the equalizer. But if they're you're doing... How'd you say it? Like if you're eating your mass... Or, eating the mashed potatoes, you can have your dessert. They're not even willing to do that, and then, oh, well, I have to do all these things to scramble to get through dinner to make get to the dessert. And it's like, you're just... Just do your the stuff that you're supposed to do. You Come know? on, play <laughs> hockey right from the beginning. Yeah, like, just put an effort in. Skate hard. 
you know, engage the opposition and confront them when they have the puck. And, you know, just all the little the small plays that don't count on the Corsi sheet. You know, yeah, it's this team is just an enigma sometimes. Well, we've got a big week coming up for the team. Let's see if maybe they can do better this week. Uh, three games till you and I broadcast next. We'll be broadcast or we will record before the Sunday games. We have uh, one more game in Ottawa on Monday at 5 p.m. start time. Then the Flames get two days off. Then Thursday, they're back here against Ottawa, 7 p.m. start time. And Saturday night is Hockey Night in Canada, where we travel just a few hours up the road to Edmonton for an 8 p.m. start time. Three games on the docket, Matt. What are you expecting? Uh, two wins, both Ottawa, lose to Edmonton. Yeah. You see, I mean, we, we should be beating Ottawa, right? We, like, we there's no reason that we should have been embarrassed in one game, and I think the team is going to come back and want to get the last two. Yeah. But, you know, this team... <laughs> it, I, you, They did well in the one game. That's great. Uh, yeah, you know, let's see a second and a third and a fourth before, like, getting any optimism, really. Yeah. You know, because, like, you look at, like, the last, since, like, even, like, the week before, like, the last eight games, they played one good one. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it, that's not, you know, just because it's the last one that they played well that's still not anything to be jumping up and down with any excitement over and well we'll just have to see like this team is has put themselves in a position where they have to prove that they can actually do the things that are needed my worry with this team is that and we see it so often with these guys is they win and then right after the win they end up maybe i don't know if it's overconfidence or what it is but they come out and end up losing so I'm going to say this week that they end up with a loss in Ottawa. They'll win against Ottawa here, and I think they're going to lose against Edmonton. So I'm going with a loss-win-loss. Yep, I could see that. But again, I think we need to see good hockey. Even if they lose two of those, I'm okay, as long as we're seeing them building that structure into their game, which we haven't seen for so long and playing the majority of the game. But it's... I think it has the possibility to be a very frustrating week. Though, I mean, if we look ahead to, you know, the next week... Ottawa and Montreal. So we've got a teams outside of, you know, Edmonton this this week. The next five games, uh, five of six, are against slumping teams in Ottawa and Montreal. So this is the time to pick up those points. Yeah, and, like, even all of uh, March's schedule, like, there's only two games against Toronto and three against Edmonton, and everybody else is, like, the lower end of our division. So... And even Edmonton's not that good. So, you know, like, Calgary could make some hay if they get their stuff together. But ifs and maybes and all of that. So, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, even though we don't think Edmonton's really good, the fact is right now they're ahead of us. And I think that, you know, you have to respect that going in there. And I worry that Calgary might go into the same and just say, oh, they're not that good. And then we end up regretting it. So, I think you've got to go in looking at them as being the better team yeah. well i think that 7-1 game i you know like if that doesn't motivate them to you know stand up against the oilers i don't know what will <laughs> that's a good point too that's a good point well let's see what happens shall we yep as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.